Okay, uh, so this morning we're uh, wrapping up the other half of our forced nutrition um, and fertilizer lecture. And so we already looked at this last class, but we're dealing primarily with the ecology and the economics here, uh, focusing a lot on those economics today. And again, we've already seen how fertilizers are applied both at establishment and mid rotation. And again, for context, keep in mind, we're really only thinking about fertilizing stands that we're managing intensively on shorter rotations. Um, pretty much all forests will respond to fertilizer application. There's just no economic reason to fertilize if we're on that longer rotation, if we're not gonna recoup that investment. So we went through parts A through C last Thursday. Uh, so today we'll start on part D here. How much should you fertilize? And this is the study uh, that has really governed a lot of what you've seen in terms of the rates um, that are recommended. So you've all seen in the readings, 150 to 200 pounds of nitrogen breaker, 25 to 50 pounds of phosphorus breaker. This is the study that came up with those numbers. So this was out of the forest productivity co-op and it was a region-wide trial. So they put the same experimental installation in across the range of Lavalli pine in many different sites. And so what they did in this study, they had 12 different treatments. They had four different levels of nitrogen application, 0, 100, 200, or 300 pounds per acre. And they had three different levels of phosphorus application, 0, 25, or 50 pounds of phosphorus per acre. And they had every possible combination of those two. So you can see we've got the three lines where the line on the bottom with the triangles is no phosphorus at those four nitrogen levels. The line in the middle is 25 pounds of phosphorus with the squares at each of those four levels of nitrogen. And the line at the top with the circles is 50 pounds of nitrogen with each of those four levels of nitrogen application. And what we looked at here is what's the volume response in cubic foot per acre over the period of years after the fertilizer was established. And so uh, when we look here, you can see you definitely want to apply phosphorus fertilizer, right? The line with the triangles is pretty low. So if you, if you don't put out phosphorus with nitrogen, you don't get much nitrogen growth response either, right? Uh, but what would you think between 25 and 50 pounds of phosphorus, the difference between the line with the squares and the line with the circles? What's going to be your best option? 25 is pretty similar to 50, right? But if it's cheaper because you're applying half the fertilizer, uh, that may make economic sense. Um, of course, you know, you are getting a little bit more growth for 50. So, you know, there's nothing to say 50 is wrong. And those are just the two levels they used in this study. I mean, you could use 30, 35. It's not that you have to use exactly 25 or exactly 50. You could use something in the middle there and also anticipate you know, an intermediate growth response between those lines. In terms of nitrogen, what sort of rate does this data suggest you might want to apply? 200, yeah. If you look, 300 kind of levels off, right? You don't get much extra growth for that extra 100 pounds of nitrogen. Um, you may have completely fixed the deficiency that you had, right? So adding more doesn't get you any more growth. Um, and so, or you may have brought growth up to another stave on that Liebig's law barrel that, that is the lowest stave now, right? And so you can see, you know, 150 pounds of nitrogen is probably halfway between the 100 and 200 there in terms of the growth response, but 200 seems to be the recommendation. So th this is the study that sort of led to these recommendations you're reading about. But when you look at actually going out and applying it, you have to use a fertilizer. And so as the forester, what we care about is the elemental rate that's going out because we want that growth response. Uh, but the contractor can't just put out nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium. They have to put out a fertilizer. And that fertilizer that they put out will be labeled with three numbers. So the example bag up there shows 5, 10, 15. And so it's saying that that bag of fertilizer is 5% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, and 15% potassium. And so you can go find miracle Grow in Lowe's for house plants, and it'll have those same three numbers in it. There's a trick to those numbers, however. The nitrogen number is true. So if that's a 40-pound bag um, of fertilizer and it's 5% nitrogen, then we know there's two pounds of nitrogen in that bag. It's 5% of the 40 pounds, whatever weight that bag is. Um, but it's not actually 10% or 15% phosphorus or potassium, like it says. Um, for historical reasons with fertilizer testing, what it's showing you is the oxidized form of those elements. So it's telling you that that bag is actually 10% P2O5, and that bag is actually 15% K2O. 
So as foresters, we care about the elemental rate, but fertilizer is always labeled with a fertilizer rate that's not the elemental rate except for nitrogen. So we have to adjust that phosphorus number and we have to adjust that potassium number. And we do that pretty straightforwardly by using the periodic table of elements. And you can look up on the periodic table, the, the atomic weight or the weight of one atom of oxygen is 16. And so we just, we don't want to account for those five oxygen atoms in the phosphorus rate. We don't want to account for that one oxygen atom in the potassium rate. So we also look at our periodic table and we see that phosphorus has an atomic weight of 30.97. Potassium has an atomic weight of 39.10. Then it's pretty straightforward math where you have two of those phosphorus atoms with five oxygen atoms. So the phosphorus atoms weigh 61.94, 30.97 times two. Um, and then we have five times 16, which gives us the weight of the oxygen atoms. And so that's gonna be uh, 80. So we add the 61.94 to 80 and the weight of the entire molecule is 141.94. And so now what we do is we just take the percentage. So the phosphorus, the 61.94 divided by the 141.94, the total molecule weight, is telling us that that P2O5 molecule is 43.6% phosphorus. The remain, remainder is the weight of the oxygen that we don't want to account for. Trees get their oxygen just like you and I do by you know, breathing, basically. They get it out of the atmosphere. And so the atmosphere is about 21% oxygen. So the nice thing is, because that's off the periodic table of elements, it never changes. And so it's always going to be 43.6% for phosphorus. You do the same thing for potassium there, and that K2O molecule is always 83.3% potassium. So, And so now what we can do is we can take this bag that has that 10% P rate on it, that's really 10% P2O5, which is only 43.6% elemental phosphorus, and so that bag is actually 10 times 0.436, that bag actually only has 4.36% phosphorus. Yeah, Kyle. Uh, you said oxygen is the element weight of 16, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's footnoted on this table on the bottom right. It's getting kind of bright in here, hard to see. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So the nice thing is, once you know those numbers, 43.6 and 83.3, they don't change. They're always going to be that, that way. Okay. So keep that in mind. And with that in mind, here are some common fertilizers that we use in, in forestry and what the rates are on the bags. So these are the bag rates. These are not the true elemental rates for phosphorus or potassium. So for nitrogen, we commonly apply urea. And so we talked about urea a little last class. Uh, this is produced uh, synthetically now, uh, very energy intensive process, um, but uh, urea is common, pretty cheap. And it's at a rate of 4500 on the bag. And so nitrogen, that number is true. So it's 45% nitrogen by weight. Um, volatilization is the issue with urea. If you put urea out, there's a naturally occurring soil enzyme that will take that fertilizer and produce N2 gas that is then just back in the atmosphere, not accessible to the trees. And so there's a few things that companies do to avoid nitrogen volatilization from urea. One, apply when it's cool out so that enzyme will be less active and apply when you think rain is likely because once that urea fertilizer is in the soil, volatilization is no longer an issue. Two, they can mix a little bit of boron in, a micronutrient with their fertilizer mix, and it tends to reduce the activity of that enzyme. Or three, there are all sorts of coatings or additives that you can purchase for fertilizers that will minimize the activity of that naturally occurring enzyme and reduce volatilization of urea. So those are all different options for urea. Uh, the next one there is ammonium nitrate, a rate of 3300. This has not been commonly applied uh, since about 1995 because it was the main ingredient used uh, to blow up the federal building in Oklahoma City. Um, so ammonium nitrate is explosive. That massive explosion a few months ago over in Lebanon, uh, that was a store of ammonium nitrate uh, that detonated. And so uh, because of the, the danger of that product and its use in improvised explosives, it's difficult to procure in the United States and we're not really using much of it anymore. So um, the, the final nitrogen bearing compound, it's one of our most common is gonna be diammonium phosphate, which is DAP. Uh, 
Um, and it's actually primarily a phosphorus source. You can see its rate is 1846-0. So it's primarily uh, providing phosphorus, but it will also provide some free nitrogen along with that, is how you can think of that. Um, for phosphorus, concentrated superphosphate uh, is pretty common, 044-0, water-soluble phosphorus fertilizer, DAP again, like we just talked about with nitrogen, and then rock phosphate. It's not water-soluble, uh, which can be a challenge. Then the other challenge with rock phosphate is it's 0 0 It has very little phosphorus in it, which means you need to apply a lot of it by weight. And so your application costs go up uh, the lower concentration the nutrient is there. Uh, almost all our potassium is being applied as potash. And so potash is going to be uh, 0 0 0060. Uh, so it just has the potassium in it. Um, you know, we're here in Nacogdoches County where we're producing, you know, more chickens uh, than most other counties in the US. So we get a lot of poultry litter. So poultry litter is commonly um, applied in forest, probably not as commonly as it could be, uh, but that's another organic source of fertilizer that you'll see used sometimes that's not on here. Um, and so to get the rate for that, you know, you'd have to do an analysis on it, take the poultry litter to the soil plant and water lab and have them figure out what's in it. Um, Another thing I've seen used in Virginia is a product they applied that was uh, called municipal biosolids. And so municipal biosolids are just a byproduct of a sewage treatment plant, it's the solids. Um, and so it's been treated to the point it no longer has E. coli in it, uh, but it can't be used on food crops. You know, you wouldn't want your corn being grown municipal biosolids for obvious reasons. Um, but we can use it in a forest and then no one cares if their two by four was grown with it. It's been debarked, it's fine. Um, and so I've seen a study where they applied it and they literally you know, applied it at a high rate. So they slung out about a foot of this on a stand, throwing it out of a skitter, it's splattering 20 feet up in trees, but uh, it worked, the stand grew really well. Five years later, you couldn't even tell it'd been applied except you'd be walking through the stand and you'd be like, huh, there's a tomato plant. That's, that's kind of odd, wonder where that came from. So, um, <laughs> so that, that's another one you'll see applied sometimes. So, yeah. Okay, so let's look at how you actually put all this together because what you want as the forester is the elemental rate, 225, 50 pounds of NP and K applied by element out there. Um, but what the contractor needs to know is how many pounds of urea, how many pounds of DAP, how many pounds of potash are you putting out there? And so when we look at this, I'll give you a chance to do some of these calculations yourself in a moment so you can actually apply this. Um, but if we start at the bottom with potassium, or yeah, with potassium, we know we're applying that with potash, so it's not gonna influence the nitrogen or the phosphorus. So we can kind of treat that as its own problem. Well, we know this potash has a rate of 0, 0, 0060, but we know the 60 is not quite right. We know that's for K2O. And so if you take the 60% K2O in that bag and you multiply it by 0.833, that tells you that 60 times 0.833 is 50. That tells us that that bag of potash is actually 50% potassium by weight, not 60%. So we got rid of the oxygen that we didn't want to account for. Well, we want 50 pounds of, a, of elemental K out there and we know our fertilizer is 50% elemental K. So the common mistake you'll make doing the math here is you'll multiply those together and you'll say, put out 25 pounds of potash and that's gonna give me 50 pounds of potassium. But you just gotta use common sense on that. What, what can you take 25 pounds of and fit 50 pounds of an element into? Nothing, that defies physics, right? So that, that's not possible. Um, so yeah, you've, you've made a math error if you've done that. So you're always gonna put out more fertilizer than your elemental rate because none of these fertilizers can possibly exceed 100% in terms of an elemental rate. So what you do is you take the 50 pounds of K you want per acre, you divide it by 0 0.50. So 50 divided by 0 0.50 equals 100. And so we want to apply 100 pounds of potash to give us 50 pounds of elemental K per acre. And so that math works backwards too. If you put out 100 pounds of potash times 0 0.50, because it's 50% elemental K, that tells us we applied the element, elemental rate of 50 pounds of K. So that one makes sense so far? Yeah, Justin. Okay. Um, okay, so next up, we know we're going to apply DAP here. So anytime you're applying DAP, 
what it's typically going to do is it's going to meet your entire phosphorus rate. And then it's also going to provide some nitrogen, but it won't meet your whole nitrogen rate. So anytime you're applying DAP, you need to start with DAP before you go on to look at your urea or other nitrogen bearing fertilizer that you're going to be applying. So we need to do that phosphorus row next. And so it's the same process again, DAP is labeled 18460, but we know the 46 includes that oxygen we want to get rid of. So 46% P2O5 times 0.436, which is the percentage of P2O5 that's elemental P. And that tells us that that DAP should have an elemental rate on it of 18% nitrogen, 20% elemental phosphorus, and no potassium. So the elemental rate on that bag should be 1820, whereas the fertilizer rate on the bag is 1846. Well, we want to apply 25 pounds of it per acre. Again, don't do the math the wrong way and claim you're putting out five pounds of fertilizer to get 25 pounds of an element. So we take that 25, we divide it by 0 0.20, and that tells us we need to put out 125 pounds per acre of DAP. Okay, but when we did that, we put out some nitrogen. That DAP we put out was 18% nitrogen. So that 125 pounds of DAP, 18% nitrogen, 125 times 0 0.18, and that tells us we already applied 22.5 pounds of nitrogen when we put out the DAP. So the, the nitrogen that DAP puts out is always gonna be a little bit less than the phosphorus that it provides uh, because it's 2% less there. And so now we want 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre, but we already put out 22.5 of it with our DAP, which means we need urea to apply the other 177.5 pounds of nitrogen. And we know that that urea is labeled at 4500. We know that's the true elemental rate because nitrogen is nitrogen in there. And so 177.5, divided by 0 0.45. And we can now tell the contractor put out 395 pounds of urea, 125 pounds of DAP, 100 pounds of potash, and you're meeting that elemental rate of 200 pounds nitrogen, 25 pounds phosphorus, and 50 pounds potassium uh, for that prescription. So any questions on how to do those calculations? Okay, so go ahead and split up into groups and uh, take a crack at a few of these here and see what you come up with. And then you can come put them up on the board. Okay, so we got a variety of different answers here. So uh, let's look at what we would need to do here um, quantitatively to figure these out. So we want 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So that's gonna be 150. And we're applying urea, which is 45% nitrogen. And so that's, divided by 0 0.45. And we don't have to do anything to that 45% because the bag rate is the same as the elemental rate. And so when you do that math, it pretty much gives you this 333 pounds of urea. And so we don't have to worry too much about the decimal there. It's not gonna make much difference in terms of how your trees are gonna grow at all. And they're flinging this fertilizer out of a fixed wing aircraft. So, getting within a third of a pound uh, per acre is kind of unrealistic. So, so there's our urea number. Um, on our next problem, uh, we want 50 pounds of elemental phosphorus per acre. So we start with the 50. Okay, and then we're gonna be applying DAP, which has a rate of 18.460. And so that's 0.46% P2O5. So this is the P2O5. And we know P2O5 is 0.436% elemental P. So that adjusts the bag rate to what the elemental rate is. In order of operations, we would want to do that first. So we'll throw it in parentheses there. And that's going to give us 250 pounds of elemental P per acre. Okay. And again, if you do any of this sort of backwards, you know, you multiply it instead of dividing, it's going to give you that unrealistic number where you're applying less fertilizer than the elemental rate. So here it's, it's the same equation. We've just modified it for phosphorus or for potassium, where we multiply the bag rate by the, what the element is within that oxidized form. Okay. And then how many pounds of nitrogen did we apply? Well, we put out 250 pounds of P. Or sorry, we put out 250 pounds. That's not P. That's going to be DAP, isn't it? So we put out 250 pounds of DAP. We know that bag of DAP is 18% nitrogen. So times 
and that is going to equal our 45 pounds of N of nitrogen. So any questions on how we calculate all that? Okay. Um, so there are practice problems set up uh, for uh, fertilizer equations, much like this um, in the use in the handout from the beginning of the semester. Uh, so make sure you review those and know how to do those. So. Okay, so that's objective D. And so we know now we're typically applying 25 to 50 pounds of phosphorus per acre, 150 to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre for mid rotation applications in our plantations. Um, and then we also know that the fertilizer bag rates are not gonna be correct for P and K. You need to adjust them to the elemental rates, so. Okay, so how is fertilizer applied? And so um, th this was a skitter-based ground application. Uh, I took that photo up in uh, Southeast Oklahoma. So this was Weyerhaeuser fertilizing a stand. And so they had their own proprietary blend of fertilizer called Arborite uh, that was some monoammonium phosphate, some other stuff mixed together, it had some boron in it um, to minimize any issues with volatilization and you know, fix any micronutrient deficiencies. And so it was a small pellet. And so they were fleeing this small dry pellet um, out of the hopper on the back of the skitter as they drove through the stand. You could see the stand had already been thinned. This was probably the second or third application on that stand. And so they're just driving around applying it. When the hopper runs out in that skitter, it drives back to the, the central area where they're doing this job. And there's a uh, large truck out there with a lot of fertilizer in it and had a conveyor belt. So it could just fill that hopper back up again, the skitter could go out and apply some more. Um, I think they had two or three of those out there applying at the same time. Uh, so it would be nice and efficient. So that's a ground-based application. Um, if you're applying poultry litter or municipal biosolids, they may have modified agricultural equipment that they're using out in the stand. So here's a tractor uh, dragging some modified ag equipment that's gonna do that application method. You know, so you may see that uh, you're probably not going to run a tractor through a stand that has, you know, much shrub, you know, shrubs in the way or slash or debris. Um, so that's going to be a consideration there. It would only work on a real clean site. If you had a landowner doing early fertilization on, you know, a small stand, they might be able to do it with an ATV. Um, we're most commonly going to see this done with like food plot management uh, around here, right, where you might fertilize your food plot. It's only an acre or two, so you can do that efficiently with an ATV. But the overwhelming majority of our commercial applications on large company land are again done with fixed wing aircraft. And so with the fixed wing aircraft, it's almost always a dry fertilizer they're applying. Um, they can carry more weight uh, and then they'll apply it that way. Uh, here's a, a shot from out at the Pacific Northwest where they're applying with a helicopter, but I, I don't know that I've ever seen that done in the U.S. South. So there are some considerations we need to make, and some of this is similar to what we talked about with aerial applications of herbicides. So it's just anytime you're doing an aerial application, are you near chicken houses, horse farms? You heard Mr. Grogan's opinion on horses um, in that video for lab. The other thing you've got to think about, do you have a thick mid-story of Yopon here? If your fertilizer gets hung up in the canopy and doesn't hit the soil, it, it's not going to be effective, right? Um, so if it's up there, it, it's not actually fertilizing your trees. Hopefully a rain would knock it out, but those are the things you need to think about. Um, we'll get more into considerations for that thick shrub layer later, but you also don't want to fertilize that thick shrub layer, right? You would be spending money to grow a weed species and not your crop. Uh, so you still don't want drift with fertilizer. You don't want to apply fertilizer to someone else's land. Um, that could get you sued, just like with herbicides. Uh, but hopefully, you know, if, if you, you know, talk to the neighbor or something, if this happens, hopefully there's less of an issue if you've accidentally fertilized their property than if you've sprayed an herbicide on it, right? Um, if the contractor goes right over your SMZs and applies fertilizer, that's not really going to be the end of the world either. You know, your SMZ trees are going to grow a little bit better. That's, that's not a, a real problem. Um, we always want to keep our nutrients out of our streams. We want them out of our waters. But in a forestry context, that's far less of an issue than what we see in urban areas uh, or with agriculture. So in urban areas, again, they're fertilizing up to four times a year on your yard. 
Um, agriculture, they're fertilizing one or more times a year potentially. And so they're fertilizing much more frequently than we are in forestry, where we're fertilizing at our most intensive about once every six years. The other big difference is we're fertilizing a deep rooted perennial crop. And so it's much less likely that you have any fertilizer leaching out of the bottom of a forest ecosystem. And all the studies I've seen where they've actually just directly intentionally fertilized an SMZ show that you do get some nutrients in the stream, but it's a small quantity for a brief time and then the streams go back to baseline. And all the studies on SMZs have basically shown, even if you only have a 25 foot SMZ, just a very minimal SMZ, trees are very effective at keeping nutrients out of streams. So those are a lot of the recommendations for agricultural land, have trees by the streams to keep the nutrients in an ag context out of the stream. We're already doing that in forestry. We're fertilizing mid rotation. So we already have those trees there. So you may get a little leaching out on real sandy textured soils. It's hard to quantify how much, but um, that, that is a possibility. Now, as the forester, what you would be doing, so if you went to work for Hancock or Rainier or Weyerhaeuser and you started working in their fertilizer program, you're not going to be out applying the fertilizer. Uh, one thing you would be commonly doing is collecting what they call catch data. So when they're applying fertilizer from fixed wing aircraft, you go out into the stand and you put little Rubbermaid tubs out at random locations throughout the forest. Uh, then the contractor applies fertilizer, then you go back and you collect those and bag them from each tub. Well, you know the area of the tubs, you can scale those data to a per acre basis, and you actually will send those fertilizer samples to a lab for chemical analysis so that you can check and make sure that the contractor is applying the correct rates of, you know, your urea, DAP, uh, potash, everything they're supposed to be applying in that prescription but you're also doing the chemical analysis. You can make sure that they are applying the chemicals uh, that you have contracted them to apply. Um, and so you're checking up and making sure that application is going uh, correctly. Um, here, what you see that this is a truck with um, a um, spreader on the back of it. And here they've got tubs spread out at different distances. So what this operator can do now is they can turn the, the spreader on um, and they can time it. They can have it on for exactly a minute, say, and then they can weigh what lands in each of those tubs. And from that weight, they'll be able to calculate how fast they need to drive to apply your target rate. And so then they can try and keep that consistent speed up through the stand. So that, that's on a truck you might see more in an agricultural setting, but you could do the same thing uh, with the skitter I showed you out on the warehouser job uh, for a forestry application. So you're collecting some sort of catch data, you're calibrating the equipment uh, to make sure that that application actually achieves the elemental rate that you have intended. So we won't get into those calculations in this class, but uh, for those in intensive silviculture, we may get into that more next class. So, so how are fertilizers applied? Again, the vast majority are from a fixed wing aircraft. Um, the vast majority of the applications that aren't fixed wing aircraft are gonna be skitter based. And then you may have some modified ag equipment in some limited cases. Um, and so you've got to think about the same operational considerations you would think about with herbicides, just you know, not quite as much downside to fertilizers as there are to herbicides. So okay, so how do stands respond? And so when we look at this last part, how are stands going to respond? Uh, what I'll show you is a framework that we can think about. Uh, that will apply not just to fertilizers, but to many of the other silvicultural treatments that we've talked about all semester. And so, of course, we're going to label these A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, we don't get to an F, there's only five of them. But so again, we're using letters. So keep track of what we're talking about if we say a type A response. This has nothing to do with A level stocking. This has nothing to do with a grade A low thin. It's completely different. So. And these work very much like grades. You would much rather have an A than a B, a B than a C, a C than a D, right? And like grades, A, B, and C are passing, uh, D and E are gonna be failing, so. So I'll show you two graphs for each of these. Uh, the left panel there is height over age. The right panel is annual height growth at any given age. And so there's gonna be two lines in each of these. The line labeled there with an A that's the half of your stand you applied this treatment to an establishment. The line labeled base, that's your baseline. That's the half of the stand you didn't apply this treatment to. So you can see what would happen 
if you didn't apply the treatment. So that's our, our control in an experiment. And so this type A growth response, we applied it at establishment. And if you look at the height at any given age, that could be a site index, right? So it has increased our site index, this type A treatment. And it's done that if you look at the panel on the right, after you apply it, it gives you extra height growth every single year. Those lines parallel one another. And so this is a treatment you can apply at establishment that will last for the entire rotation and continue to fuel increased height growth rates. Here's an example of what a type A growth response treatment might be. So it might be phosphorus fertilizer application on a severely P deficient site. So you have two photos there taken a few hundred feet from one another at a research study on a severely P deficient site. They did not fertilize in that photo on the left and you don't even have pulpwood sized trees there. That's basically an open woodland. You don't really have much of a forest there. Look at all the light hitting the ground. The photo on the right, they did apply phosphorus at establishment and you have a nice timber stand mid rotation there. So huge difference. So type A growth response is what you really want. Um, the woody controls. So you all did those prescriptions trying to get that silvo pasture established last week in lab. The woody control at establishment can yield you a type A growth response. So getting that woody control right is really important because it can yield you a huge growth response that lasts for the duration of the entire rotation. Here's a type B growth response. You can see it's not quite as good as a type A growth response because it, after you apply it, it fuels additional height growth for a period of a few years, but then it goes back to baseline, okay, in that panel on the right. So you, you have improved site index. Your, your trees are a little taller at any given age, but it doesn't continue to pull away from the baseline year after year after year. So it's like a type A growth response, but for a much shorter duration, not for the whole rotation. And so nitrogen fertilizer mid-rotation is a great example of a type B growth response. It's a good treatment, but it only gives the trees that six to 10 year window where they get that growth response. After that, they're gonna grow much like the baseline treatment. So here's a type C growth response. And so what a type C growth response is, is it does give you that growth response, but it's temporary because the baseline will eventually catch up to it. And so with a type C growth response, it's still a good treatment. If you're able to harvest timber in that window where it's ahead of baseline, okay? If you're on a long rotation without thinning, there's absolutely no reason to do a treatment that yields a type C growth response because by the time you get to the end of that long rotation, the baseline stand and the treated stand are the same, okay? Because the baseline catches back up. So here's an example of that. If you bed a stand and put it on a 50 year rotation, you're gonna miss the window when you can capture the benefit of that bedding, okay? If you bed a stand and manage it on a 25 year rotation, you're gonna be harvesting it in that window where you are gonna capture that growth response. So the years on the x-axis aren't quite right for that example I just gave you, but if you look right where the word base is and the letter C is there on that panel on the left, that would be like the end of the rotation if you're at 25 years. But if you go up where baseline and the, the C line converge again, that would be like a 50 year rotation for a bedded stand. And it makes sense why it's kind of a temporary response because bedding just gives you good early growth and survival. But then later in the rotation, once your trees are larger, if you've gotten them to survive on, a, on your control untreated area, if you've gotten your trees to survive, they lower the water table, they don't need that bedding. And the bedding, those raised microsites may not be ideal in a really hot, dry summer, right? Having the trees up on those. So you can see how the baseline might catch back up on a long rotation. Okay, so here's a type D growth response. And this is a good example of why we need long-term data in forestry. You do a type D treatment and you look at them and you're like, this is awesome, it's working, my stand's growing better. But then if you keep following it to the end of the rotation, oops, you made a mistake. It ended up worse than the baseline treatment. So we've already talked about one treatment that fits this description and that's wind rowing. And so when you wind row a stand, it's really clean. Your planting job goes smoothly. Your chemical applications go smoothly because you've gotten rid of the slash. And so everything looks great. Your stand starts growing. You've got it established really well, but then you go back out there mid to late rotation and you notice that the trees right by the windrows are real big. The trees in between the windrows are real small. 
and you realize you've made a big mistake with that wind rowing because you've messed up how nutrients and organic matter are distributed throughout your site. And so that's an example of a type D growth response. And that's why you want to avoid treatments like wind rowing. They may look good initially, but in the long term, they're not a good treatment. Here's the type E growth response. Um, and so this is where the treated stand is always gonna be worse off uh, than the untreated stand. So this was a treatment that backfired on me. This is what we call the college station growth response. So, um, so you don't wanna do this. This would also be what you call a career limiting move. Um, I could not come up with a silviculture example for this because we're not doing treatments that cause this. But say you mismanaged a highly erodible soil and had really bad gully erosion, like in that photo, that would be an example of a type E growth response where you accidentally, you know, moved all the slash off it, burned it after a clear cut, and you got a ton of erosion. Uh, that's not good. Um, another example might be if a mining company was out strip mining and they went out of business and went bankrupt before they were able to reclaim that land, that unreclaimed land would show you that type E growth response. So um, they have bonds now under the SMRCRA Act where the federal government should be able to step in and use that bond money to reclaim that land, but um, that has happened in the past. So, so we won't worry about the type B or type E growth responses because you all aren't gonna prescribe those treatments, uh, but let's compare the type A, B and C growth responses now on the same graph so you can see the differences. So here's cumulative height growth over time, A is good, B is good, but not quite as good as A. And then C, it still gives you an advantage if you can harvest in that window, but it's, it's more time dependent with the type C treatment. But that's just height growth. Let's look at basal area now. So what we'll notice on this logistic curve for basal area, that type A growth response, it, it has moved to a higher maximum basal area, whereas type B and C have not compared to baseline. That means the type A treatment has fundamentally increased carrying capacity on that site. You can carry a higher maximum basal area. But let's think about timing too. So what I want you to look at is that horizontal uh, grid line on the graph uh, that falls between the, the letter B and the letter C up there. And so if that line represented the basal area that would trigger your decision to, hey, we probably need to thin this, look at what happens. Type A hits that line first, which means you can get your first thin in at a younger age. Type B and type C also get there before the baseline treatment. So what all these treatments are doing is they're pushing your stand through stand development more quickly. They're growing your stand faster. It may follow the same trajectory, but what might happen is your 14 year old stand you applied the type B treatment on and your 18 year old untreated stand may look very, very similar to one another. So you just got the type B stand there a lot quicker. Here's what volumes look like. So you really want that type A treatment, right? It gives you a great growth response. Type B, again, you always have that increase in volume. So that's still a good treatment. Type C, if you harvest in that window when it's ahead of baseline, you may have that as a good treatment. But if you wait too long, there was no reason to do that type C growth response treatment. And so there's all that written down there for you. A increases carrying capacity. A, B, and C will accelerate stand development and move you through your rotation more quickly. You'll hit those commercial thins earlier. You'll be able to clear cut earlier. And so that has some big economic advantages. And don't do the type C treatment if you're gonna be on a long rotation, if you're not gonna be able to harvest in that window when there's a reason to do that type C treatment. Okay, so that's growth responses. Let's look a little bit more about putting all of this together. Okay, um, so there's a photograph of a stand. So you've got a pine stand. And we already talked about last class with fertilizer, we commonly think about using leaf area index where nutrients grow leaves, leaves grow the trees. And so if we look at this stand here, that whole stand may have a leaf area index of five, but two may be in that shrub layer right there. So the, the crop trees have a leaf area index of three, the non-crop vegetation has a leaf area index of two. Okay, so with the leaf area index of five, that's not a stand that will probably respond to fertilizer. If you put fertilizer out there, you maybe grow the trees a little better, but not a lot. You're gonna grow those shrubs a little better, but maybe not a lot. But instead of fertilizing on this stand, 
What if instead you just went out and you applied an herbicide application from a skitter? So you dramatically knock back the leaf area index on the shrub layer. If you do that, that's just like fertilizing the stand. Now, instead of those shrubs using those nutrients and water on that site, it's going to the crop trees. So on a stand like this, fertilizer may not be your best treatment. Herbicide might be your best treatment. So we've talked about thinning, herbicide, and fertilizer now. They all work together. And so you need to sort of have them all packaged together in order to get the growth response that you want. So there's an example where an herbicide application will probably give you more growth than a fertilizer application. Here's a study where on the left, you see a photo where they fertilized only. On the right, they did fertilizer and herbicide. So many times you'll wanna pair these treatments. Um, if you have any shrub problem at all, you probably need to fertilize and use herbicide. You probably don't wanna just fertilize. But here's the other thing you can start thinking about. Fertilizer commonly follows oil and gas prices. It's an energy intensive process to produce it, whether you're mining phosphorus based fertilizers or using chemical processes to produce nitrogen based fertilizers. And so given the cost, if oil and gas is expensive and fertilizers are expensive, and of course when oil and gas are expensive, you know, airline fuel is going to be expensive and so fertilizer application is going to be costly. Herbicide application may be a little bit costly as well uh, with those helicopters they're applying it with. And so in those circumstances, you may not want to fertilize. A stand that has a lot of shrubs, you may just do the herbicide. The herbicide may be a much cheaper option because your materials, the herbicides themselves are much cheaper. And so that gives you the most bang for your buck. If it's a time like right now where oil and gas prices are pretty darn cheap, now might be a good time to go out there and fertilize and herbicide. Or if you're only going to use one, just fertilize. And so you can use timing in the market too uh, to help dictate what treatments you're applying. Here's a study where they compared fertilize, fertilizer, herbicide, or, or both and looked at the growth response. And so you can see fertilizer gave them a 400 cubic foot per acre growth response. Um, herbicide gave them half that, a 200 cubic foot per acre growth response. So 400 plus 200 should equal 600, right? But when they applied both, they only got a 500 cubic foot per acre growth response. There's good reason for that. In some cases, these treatments are doing the same thing, right? So the herbicide application is killing non-crop vegetation, which is then making those nutrients available to the trees. So it's really fertilizing. It. And so it's doing the same thing, which is why you don't see an additive or larger than additive interaction in this case. So here, you know, if, if prices are cheap for all these treatments right now, your best option might be to go with both. It might be to just fertilize that stand, okay? If fertilizer is really expensive, you can still get some growth response on that site just with herbicide application. Not as good as fertilizer, but if it's a lot cheaper, it may still be your best treatment from an economic perspective. So that'll be on the quiz for Thursday. And then uh, to summarize, any, any questions? Yeah, so that's a really complicated looking diagram, uh, but it's, it's really just showing you something that you all have already figured out by now writing all these prescriptions. So what this is showing you is a decision tree where you only are looking at four different treatments, site prep, woody control, weed control, and early fertilization. And for woody control, weed control, and early fertilization, it's not even giving you many options. It's not saying what chemicals do I apply? It's just saying, yes, do it or no, don't do it. So it's not even the full range of complexity with all the different chemicals we apply. For mechanical site prep there near the far left, it's a choice between combination plowing, bedding, or not doing anything, okay? So if we take three options for mechanical site prep times two for woody control, that's six possible outcomes, times two more for weed control, that's 12 possible outcomes, times two more for early fertilization. What you see here on the far right is 24 different possible prescriptions you can come up with just with that very limited set of treatments. This hasn't included the genetics of your seedlings, what spacing you're planting them at, any of that other stuff. And so you can see, this is one reason these prescriptions are so frustrating to you all, right? Because you know it's, it's not a multiple choice test with four answers. There's lots of different possible outcomes here. So you could go from the most intensive prescription that follows everything at the top, where you do a combination plow, then you do woody control, then you do weed control, uh, then you do early fertilizer application. Compare that with the bottom where you do nothing. You just do absolutely nothing. And that gives you that box on the very bottom there at the far right. 
And then you've got the 22 options in between where you're doing some you know, partial combination of those. What they're showing you on the far right is those growth responses. So the one at the top, when you do everything, it's saying that the combination plow is a type B growth response. The woody control is a type A growth response. The weed control is a type C growth response. And the early fertilization is a type A growth response. So it's nesting a type B on top of a type A on top of a type C on top of a type A growth response. But again, if I flip back a slide, that doesn't mean it's just gonna add all those growth responses together, right? Uh, the interaction of all of them may be less than additive. So um, you compare that with the bottom right where it's giving you no growth response at all. And then again, you can see every combination in between there. So, so th this is why it's so complicated. This is why you see that the companies, the big companies where they can pay biometricians with PhDs and they've paid big money to get a lot of data from these industry university research cooperatives and they have complex GIS systems, lots of modeling, and they can kind of figure out how to fine tune their prescriptions to pick one of these options on a particular site that's gonna work best. But if you're working as a consulting forester and you're running your own business, you know that you're probably using a lot more of the art of silviculture. You don't have the time or resources to get into that level of detail. Um, and so you're just sort of guessing what the best options are gonna be based on your experience and everything you've learned. And of course, this is showing you that type A growth response to early fertilization. But you may go, you know, one county over and work on a different stand. This stand may have been phosphorus limited. And so it is a type A growth response with early fertilization. But then you go a county over and you're working on an old field. And that old field has been fertilized for years. Now it's not a type A growth response on that site. Um, so it differs. So, you know, that's one decision tree for one site, but it may be a different outcome on a completely different site, right? So, so it gets complicated, but you really have to start putting all this stuff we've been learning together. Um, and you have been doing that already on your prescriptions. So, so to, to summarize these two lectures, you know, fertilizer application increases growth in our Southern pine stands, it works. Um, I have heard some of these industry folks say they have not found a stand that fertilizer won't make them money on in East Texas. So um, pretty much all our forests globally are nitrogen limited. Nitrogen is our most limiting nutrient. Um, a lot of our stands around here are going to be phosphorus limited, potassium limited, maybe some micronutrients. And so it'll increase growth. But the problem is with Liebig's law, with each site having that barrel with staves at different heights on it, it's hard to figure out what exactly is most limiting on a given site. Um, we have a series of imperfect tools that can help us with that, but none of them are ideal. You may not have access um, to some of them. And then all these nutrients are cycling differently on top of that. They interact with the soil differently and the texture of the soil, the pH of the soil will change how they are available to a plant. You may have a lot of nutrients out on a stand, but almost none of them are available to the plant at any given moment. So it, it's a complicated story. Um, so fertilizer yields economic returns, but you need information in order to decide how much return you're gonna get, um, which means if you don't have that information, your risks go up. Your, your risk of putting something out and not getting your growth response, you wasted that money, it goes up. So we see a lot of fertilization in the South. We've fertilized more than half of our plantation acreage, but it's almost exclusively the big companies doing it because they, have the data available to them to assess that risk um, and make well-informed decisions. Most of us really don't have as much information. So, so that's fertilizer application, force nutrition. Any questions? <laughs>